Hi, I'm Pat Gunn, and this is the second in a series of educational videos on how programmers write apps. Uh, this is a sequel to the previous uh, um, video that I did on the DWS or Dr. Web Services, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that I've done since that uh, first, I guess it was about half an hour of coding. Um, I put in an, uh, another, maybe a little bit over half an hour now uh, since then. Um, and it's still f uh, fleshing out the code. It didn't actually change the function of the code, but uh, it's organizational work needed to drive the code forward. Uh, one thing that I did is I put the code up on GitHub. So if you were to go to github.com slash p-g-u-n-n slash d-w-s, you'll spot that the code is up there now. Depending on when you view this, the code might be considerably more advanced than it is as of time of my making this video. So if you want to follow along exactly, then you'll want to scoot back in the history of the code to December 24th in the late evening. Uh, so, uh, one of the things uh, that I, I had to do before I uh, made this video was figure out how to best organize your code on GitHub for projects written in Go. Because I've coded a lot in other languages, and generally they aren't particularly opinionated as to how uh, they should be represented on code sharing sites, because they don't interact with that. Go is a little bit different in that as a language, it has some tools for automatically fetching uh, libraries that you don't have yet. Um, and this is a built-in language feature. Uh, some other languages actually do kind of have tools to do this, but they're kind of peripheral and you don't really need to be, uh, you don't really need to work with them in order to work with the code. Uh, with Go, uh, it uh, just uh, maybe I should give a little bit more context on that. In the land of C, which is kind of the great granddaddy of a lot of programming languages, your compiler, uh, at uh, you interacted with your compiler uh, if you decided to do it at this level by typing something like cc uh, and then the name of your source file, dash o, and then the output file that you wanted. You'd, you'd use a somewhat different invocation if you were making a library, but at heart, uh, your interaction with your compiler was very simple, but fairly frequently that wasn't uh, wasn't that great. So you'd use some other tools that would do that for you, and oftentimes this would end up uh, being a tool called Make. And Make is designed to invoke your compiler for you to pull in all the libraries that you need, uh, to pull in all the includes that you need. Uh, stuff like that, and uh, just figure out and do the invocation. So uh, that's cool, but it, it also meant that if you didn't have everything that you needed to build the software, typically the best that you could do is uh, have nice warnings telling the user, hey, you need to go install this library because you need the development headers to build this software. Um, uh, languages like Perl and Python, by contrast, they have dependency management. And if you're installing, if you're not actually compiling stuff, but you just want to install stuff, you could tell them, "Hey, uh, uh, CPN manager for Perl, go grab this library for me and install it." Or, um, or you could do the equivalent for Python. You could do the equivalent for a lot of very, very modern languages. And Go, despite being a systems language, it's trying to be more modern in that respect. So it has opinions on how stuff should be formatted, uh, so that people can, uh, so that code can easily install more code. And so what this boils down to is that the structure of code inside of a GitHub repo needs to match Go's expectations. And it turns out, uh, and Java did this too, to a certain extent, but it was more advisory. With, with Java, typically you'd name the classes that you were uh, designing uh, so that the origin of the class, like who wrote it, was near the, the front. I mean, it actually had a particular format, but I don't want to go into the details. 
but the who uh, the who of who wrote it goes into the front and then you'd have a, a series of slashes that would take you closer and then finally you'd have the uh one sec and so finally you'd have uh, i'm sorry one of my cats is trying to get in the video um and so you'd you'd have this path of getting more specific until you finally got down to the full path for that library um which was interesting but not a lot of tooling used it with go i believe that it can fetch uh, go code from github for you rather than requiring that your code exist in specially formatted repos and so to make that work you need to put your code on github in a particular format and so i had to look up that format but that uh, it wasn't too bad for the curious Typically, uh, you would just have the um, the, so the source root in your Go source directory. Uh, you would drop that into uh, uh, into GitHub, and that would be kind of the top of uh, top of your tree. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, not under slash src, but under slash src slash github.com slash and your username and then your project and then your code just starts right there and that's how retrieval should be made possible so i did that um, i uploaded all the code that i had written and talked about before and uh, and then i decided what are the things that i need to do to make uh, to get myself ready to do the serious coding i already had a rough database design um, that I sketched out for you in the first video. And so it seemed to make sense to go through and lay out functions that would retrieve the data needed for the code to display. And uh, I, I don't want to implement the functions fully right now, so I just wrote stubs. And because Go actually does some sanity checks for you, I didn't include the return types to the functions yet because I wasn't quite sure. I didn't want to, nail, uh, to commit myself to that yet. And also, in order to do the return types, I might have had to have done considerably more coding. So instead, I just identified the functions that I needed. I documented what the function should do. And then I identified the, uh, the SQL query or queries that would most line up with those functions for the things that touch the database. You'll note that I do not use an, uh, an ORM. Um, an ORM is a tool that will automatically figure out how to retrieve uh, information from databases for you. I don't like them because they tend to perform well and they tend to isolate you from really thinking about how to lay, out, uh, lay things out in the database. Um, admittedly, that means that I need to write a lot of glue code myself, but uh, it's a preference. It's the way that I do things. Uh, different programmers have different habits. Uh, so anyhow, uh, I did that, and so my code has it now. And in doing so, I found out that some of my initial con uh, some of my initial design for the database was incomplete. Had to make a few more tables and had to add some fields to some tables. But now I'm reasonably confident, having gone through this exercise, that the database design is nearly complete. There might still be some small mistakes that I've made. But because I've written the SQL queries, uh, I at least kind of validated that part of the design. And so, uh, as, uh, as mentioned, these are just stubs. The functions don't do anything and nothing calls them. But they're there uh, in the code, and the next step is pretty obvious. I would just need to go through and implement those functions and then hook them up into the main uh, event loop and bam I'd have a simple blog. Uh, there are some some things that I might be missing. Uh, oh I, so I guess I haven't yet thought about how to display the uh, the information yet and that conceivably I'm going to want to have a web interface. I might decide to add an RSS or Atom feed uh, maybe both uh, to this thing and um, and I guess there's the question of how do I want to enter data into this. One of the things that I had in my previous wiki blog engine 
the first thing I implemented with those uh, was a command line client that would just pop open Vim, which is a text editor, and I'd make blog entries, and when I closed it up, the, uh, the script that I would write would just push it into the, the database. Um, that was fine for me, but eventually uh, I decided that it would be nice to have a web interface too for posting things, and I made one. And uh, I, at roughly the same time, I made comments, uh, added comment support to my blog. Um, I don't anticipate adding comment support to this blog, uh, to this blog software, except possibly via an external comment system. One of the problems with the internet today is that if you provide a means for people to put text anywhere and other people can see the text, then unfortunately people will write ad bots that will go through and post uh, um, adverts for uh, all sorts of things from sexual aids to uh, sweepstakes to all sorts of other junk that people usually shouldn't want at all. And I was a little bit surprised that people did this for my blog because as far as I know, very, very few people use my, my wiki blog software anywhere. And so it seems a little bit odd that someone would go through the trouble, but maybe people have even automated uh, the writing uh, of bots so that they will look at a web form and try gluing stuff in and looking for responses. It was really annoying. Um, I actually had to start cleaning up spam from my blog. Uh, something which I really never thought I would have to do. And so using an external comment system like Discus or something like that would just save me a lot of pain. Um, so if, if I'm going to support comments in this thing, I'm going to do it through a, a system like that. And I'll have to look into how to write that kind of glue. I don't expect it's particularly hard because most people who are writing web software uh, actually are not particularly strong programmers. And that usually works to your benefit since uh, I mean usually what this means is that there's they're standing on top of the work of others who will write generic web platforms and then you get a specialist who will learn that platform and who might not be somebody who could write the platform themselves they could customize it because I can do the whole thing I have no doubt that hooking into one of those com external comment systems will be easy for me if I decide to do that anyhow so the design is pretty much complete. Uh, the functions that I have, uh, I want to be able to store settings in a database. So I wrote a function called, uh, oh, actually I should probably, uh, oh yeah, I wrote a function called get config value that will look in the config table in the database and return a config value. Um, I wrote a function called get blog entry that should return everything that you might need to display a blog entry. I wrote a function called identify last n blog entries that'll just return the ID of the last so many blog entries, possibly skipping the private ones, um, because I suppose I'll probably have private blog entries. I did that with uh, with my old wiki blog software. I like that functionality. Uh, fu I like that functionality because I think blogging is often something you do as much as your, uh, for yourself as for others. Um, I had some kind of fancy features that I'm not sure I'm going to keep moving forward, uh, like the uh, ability to mark certain sections of a blog entry as private. I think it's, at least initially, I'm just going to assume that either a whole entry is public or a whole entry is private. Maybe I'll change my mind on that, but just I, I don't want to uh, sign up for that for now. Um, I also want to be able to tag blog entries so that I can note like some topics that I covered and easily identify all the blog entries that are, t are tagged that way. Uh, so I have tag ID for tag and identify blog entries with tag that I'll use for that. And then for the review stuff, um, I, I have a get all topics, a get all topics and topic ID, identify all reviews for target ID, and get review. And those four functions should let me build a nice uh, list of all reviews organized by topic and let people uh, click on them. So I'm feeling pretty good about this design. Uh, it is a little bit annoying that I am uh, had to write so much boilerplate and that I actually have to implement a whole bunch of kind of boring functions. But again, that's what you get when you decide not to use an ORM. 
um, and uh, and things are coming together. I I don't uh, I'm not sure when I'm going to spend more time on this. Uh, I would I kind of thought that it would be nice to have something before the uh, before the end of the year, but I'm just trying to really relax, do a little bit of gaming, do a lot of reading. Uh, take some walks around New York City, and so I'm not really divide. Uh, I'm not really devoting much of my attention to this, um, but uh, I I thought that uh, again I thought I should keep doing videos uh, talking about my progress so that people can get a feel for what it's like to code. Admittedly, I'm probably not keeping my language as simple as as I should. This is maybe more designed for people who have either done light programming or have, who have done uh, more heavy programming, but not in Go. But uh, still, I, I hope it's interesting and useful to some people. And uh, I'll do another entry the next time I feel that I'd uh, I'd like to uh, talk about this. Anyhow, uh, take care and bye bye.